Are you tired of decreasing, disappearing, and declining airline service? United Airlines may have the answer. Let's find out whether normal transcontinental travel has returned. Hello, Jet Setters. I'm Jeb Brooks from GreenerGrass.com. Right now, I'm in San Francisco. It's time to head back east, so I'm going with United Airlines to JFK. That's right. They're back. Is this a return to something looking like normal? Looking back on it, finding live music on a sidewalk in San Francisco and seeing the city fill with life might have been our first hint that normalcy could be approaching. But would United's brand new service to JFK continue the trend? Today's trip will take just under five hours, covering 2,500 miles at an initial cruising altitude of 35,000 feet before climbing up to 39,000 feet. As we head to the airport and get checked in, let me share why this is so special. For a long time, flights between New York and the West Coast, specifically San Francisco and Los Angeles, have occupied outsized roles in airlines' premium offerings. American, Delta, JetBlue, and United each offer some kind of specific, specialized, upgraded service on these routes. Now, by premium, I mean everything from higher-end food to elevated seats or even special lounge access. Now, largely tied to the prestigious nature of these city pairs, these upgrades often offer vastly better services than what you'd see from airlines on less competitive routes. For more about these, check out the Transcon Throwdown in which I compared pre-pandemic services offered by each of these airlines on these routes, but maybe it's time for a redo. Let me know in the comments. Today, we were traveling on board a 767 with a particularly low-density configuration. Ordinarily, a United 767-300 has space for 214 people, but this one only carries up to 167. More about that when we get on board. Passengers traveling on this route in business class have access to United's lounges at SFO. This is a difference between a typical domestic first class ticket and this trip. This lounge with its classic old world style offered plenty of seating, decent ramp views, and standard COVID era food offerings. Unfortunately, coffee had to come from the bar, which maintained a five or 10 minute wait. Hopefully these self-service machines will come back soon. It's time to head to the gate and get this trip started. Let's go. Meanwhile, out in the terminal, United, like most airlines these days, finds ways to highlight its efforts to keep its cabins clean and safe. Nothing quite as exciting as the anticipation of a new to me service. So we're leaving today from gate F14. How cool is that? The business class cabin on this plane is uh, the biggest or largest on a 767 in the whole fleet. And it's pretty much full. So that's uh, a pretty exciting thing for United. Almost the moment I arrived at the gate, boarding began. On this configuration, the odd numbered rows on the windows offer more privacy and easier access to those windows. I'd booked 9A. The first thing that struck me was that there were actual amenities on the seat. Headphones, pillows, and a blanket. What was this, 2019? Perhaps best of all. Is this an amenity kit? And it was. We'll look inside in just a bit. The seats are really well designed. I've always been impressed with Polaris and the application here on this 767 was no exception. The passageway to the seat is narrow, but manageable. There's a shelf and a cabinet, which was stocked with a bottle of water and a mirror. Beneath, you'll have a remote control, universal plug, and headphone jack. There's a convenient reading light above and a button here that lowers the armrest. The screen is large, bright, and operates with touch. You'll have access to a USB charger here, a small shelf there, and convenient and intuitive seat adjustments, although somehow I kept activating the do not disturb sign. The cabin did not seem quite as clean as United would lead you to believe out in the terminal, which is why I suppose they gave us all sanitizing wipes. 
Despite not having doors, the cabin arrangement means these odd-numbered seats feel remarkably private. There's ample footroom, of course, and plenty of storage for all my stuff. The coat hook was also a helpful addition to the seat's design. With this configuration, overhead storage is no problem on board, which was good for us since we were connecting on JFK to another airline and needed to carry our bags in order to make that connection. As we waited for the plane to fill up, it was great to see so many people getting ready to head up into the friendly skies. Soon, we pushed and were on our way. Our departure offered great views of San Francisco Bay and many overloaded cargo ships waiting to deliver all the goods we need. Once airborne, I settled in, and that was easy to do on this flight. United provided the best single piece of kit in the sky. It's their gel pillow. I thought these had gone away, but was overjoyed when I saw this was still being offered. It's incredible. It's like somehow it's always as cool as the other side of a normal pillow. If you like travel and aviation, be sure to click the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you don't miss out on videos like this one. The tray table was massive and sturdy, exactly what you'd want in business class. I checked out the amenity kit, which had everything you'd expect on a flight of about five hours, including a special postcard, which the cabin crew encouraged us to send to a friend to help spread the word about this new service. I thought this video might do a better job. United's in-flight entertainment is impressive to say the least. The screen, as I mentioned before, was excellent, and the content was worthy of such a device. There was plenty on offer, and I decided to go old school for my first ever screening of Citizen Kane. There's a reason it's still rated as one of the best films of all time. It's possible to stream the entertainment to your own device at no cost. Internet access for a fee is also available. Our pilot announced we'd reached our initial cruising altitude. Our initial cruising altitude to New York today. I decided to try on the provided headphones when I noticed that for some reason there were two sets. One was waiting for me on the seat and the other was here in the cabinet. I ended up using my own Bose QC20s. As great as Citizen Kane was, I found it difficult not to get distracted by the views from the window, and my mind drifted a little bit to this route and how it's starting again. Back in October 2015, United announced it was pulling out of JFK completely. They figured having service to nearby Newark was sufficient. But only a few years later, in 2018, the airline's then president, Scott Kirby, acknowledged this was a mistake and expressed a desire to return but getting their slots back proved challenging. Then along came a pandemic, which slowed the return even more. Finally, flights from LAX and SFO returned to JFK on the 28th of March of 2021, and that long and winding road brings us to breakfast on this flight. United has adapted their service a bit. As you can tell, the food comes covered. Now, a hot meal on an airplane is a rare treat on any trip, and this kale, mushroom, and chicken sausage tartlet was really good. Side note, don't forget to release the pressure on your yogurt at altitude. A quick poke is better than a yogurt-covered cabin. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It's an odd, but worthy comment. United wins the textile game. I come from North Carolina, the textile capital of the USA, and they really nailed the details here. That smooth air only lasted so long. The seatbelt sign returned, but the beauty of the Rockies continued below. In the before times, this service would have included things like a printed menu, food coursed out on multiple trays, glassware, and an improved snack before landing. 
do these things need to come back before we can call this normal? Or is the current offering enough for you? Let me know in the comments below. Once the seatbelt sign was turned off again, I decided to stretch my legs a bit. This so-called high j configured 767-300 offers 99 economy seats arranged in a 232 configuration. The seats closest to the windows are better for couples. There are 22 premium plus seats with a 22 configuration. Any combination is great for couples. And a whopping 46 Polara seats set up in an unusual 111 configuration. That's an improvement over their old 212 configuration on the same aircraft type. It really means if you're traveling alone, this is the best you can do. These Polara seats all lay fully flat, which is a tremendous benefit on overnight flights. I tried it out, but didn't sleep during the day. The shoulder space was a bit narrow, as was the footwell, but I don't think sleeping on the seat would be too much of a challenge. Again, I'd booked 9A, which has the added bonus of offering not one, but two dedicated windows. I highly recommend this seat. We crossed over the coast of Lake Michigan, somewhere between Milwaukee and Chicago, about three and a half hours after departing San Francisco. That's significantly faster than the 52 hours it took to travel that distance by train. Keep an eye here on my channel for a video about that trip. Flight attendants came around with an additional snack and beverage service. I opted for my kryptonite, potato chips. But other snacks were also on offer. Before long, we were over Scranton, PA, and our descent was imminent. Of course, I usually only offer Jeb scores on international first and business class flights, but that's going to be a while. And with hot meals, nearly full service, a fully flat seat, and just a generally impressive experience, I'm going to go ahead and give it a go on this trip. Now, I rate flights using five categories with up to five stars in each one. I look at the lounge, the seat, the IFE, the food, and the service. Now this is completely subjective and unscientific. The lounge in this case was basic, but had a certain old school charm. I understand COVID limitations are all over the board depending on where you are, and California's fairly restrictive. But I was sorry that there was no way to get coffee other than wait in the same line as people ordering cocktails. This lounge earns three stars. The seat is great. I really like Polaris. Sure, United does not have a version with a door, but that's pretty much really just a gimmick, let's face it, and the seat offers plenty of privacy. It was comfortable, and I could have slept if I wanted to. This is a four-star seat. The in-flight entertainment is fantastic. Both the screen and the selections are solid. Four stars all day long. The food was tasty, and having a hot meal on any flight is a rare treat these days. Given the context and what you'll get on most domestic flights, this is worthy of four stars. The service was stellar. At a time when the job is harder than it's ever been, our cabin crew were attentive and positive. They engaged passengers who wanted that kind of interaction and left everyone else alone. This was five star service. So that leaves United's premium SFO to JFK service with 20 out of 25 stars. I've been accused of being a generous grader, but I genuinely enjoy traveling and am grateful for these experiences. I admit that this is a subjective and unscientific methodology, and I suppose all of that colors my perspective. United is not usually my first choice, but your creative director is a United groupie, and I'm glad we followed her lead on this one. It was a great trip. I will say, the experience would be different leaving JFK since, as of the time of our trip, United does not have a lounge at JFK. But as always, what do you think? Between now and the next time, see in the sky.